My name is Derek Velasquez. And I'm Isla Cal. And we're your One Star Platinums here at Evolution Travel. We are honored to host today's very informative tax training. Sandy Bakkins is a CPA tax attorney. Sandy has been training millions of small businesses how to get their taxes down to the legal limit for over 30 years. He also teaches tax reduction at Tony Robbins Wealth Seminars and is a bestseller author of the book, Lower Your Taxes Big Time, and several other best-selling business books. Sandy is a frequent guest tax expert on NBC, ABC, Fox, and CNN. As a young man, Sandy worked for the IRS training their corporate tax lawyers before joining a big five accounting firm. After three years, he left that firm to start his own company. His sole passion today is to educate small businesses, people about the huge tax breaks available to them and to do it in fun and, and the entertaining way. He has earned the reputation as the number one tax expert for small businesses and home-based businesses owners in the North America. I'm going to pass over the mic to Mr. Sandy Buckins. Are you there, sir? I am, Derek. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. The floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was so nice. And hello, everyone. I got to tell you how honored I am to be participating uh, with Derek and Evolution Travel. And, but also, I'm very honored speaking to you self-employed individuals. I mean, heck, my parents were self-employed. I'm self-employed. So I've always had a lot of respect for people who are willing to take a little more risk in order to make a lot more money. Now, I've, there's a lot I'm going to be covering. This new tax law, I don't know how much you know about it, is one of the biggest economic and tax uh, seismic shifts that I've seen in probably 40 years. It's a huge, huge deal for you both in recruiting as well as in your own taxes. I'm also going to be speaking fairly quickly. I'm an ex-New Yorker and I can go at uh, 60 miles an hour with a 120 mile an hour breeze, so I can really move. But the good news is that this is being recorded and you will have access to the recording. I also want to give a very special shout out to people like Sharita who is translating for ASL people, so thank you so very much. And hopefully I won't go too fast for you, Sharita, but that's my nature, okay? All right, first of all, a little background about me. I've been told that the picture is a lot better looking than I am. I am a CPA, I'm a tax attorney, I'm a former IRS attorney and trainer of IRS attorneys nationwide in their corporate tax division. So if you think of an IRS agent as a rat, I guess that makes me the head rodent. I've been lecturing with my company called the Tax Reduction Institute for well over 35 years. I'm a best-selling author, as Derek noted, with a book, Lower Your Taxes Big Time. And I have another book that's garnering some terrific reviews called Achieve Financial Freedom Big Time. And I've been a guest tax expert on Fox, CNN, CBS, and CNBC. And I'm not saying this to impress you. I just want you to know that I know what I'm talking about, okay? I'm gonna put you, uh, Derek, you might wanna mute yourself. I hear a lot of noises on your end. You might wanna put yourself on mute a little bit. Here. Okay, move on to where I am here. First of all, I wanna emphasize a couple of things here. Uh, there's a lot of incredible opportunities for small business people as a result of this law, but not all savings are automatic. This doesn't come automatically. There are some things that you need to know, and there are some things that you need to do in order to take advantage of these savings. Now, I want to introduce you a little bit to the players. Back up for a moment. You've got Congress who makes the rules. So if you like the law, good, you can praise Congress. If you don't, it's Congress's fault. They then make the rules for you, and you in turn, uh, for your business, and IRS enforces the rules. Now, what's interesting is that the main centerpiece of this tax law was to lower the corporate, the major corporate tax rates. These rates were lowered from 35% to a flat rate of 21% for people that are C corporations, regular corporations. And if you don't know what a C corporation is, you probably are not one. But generally, public companies are C corporations. Okay. And the way C corporations work is they're a little different in that they pay tax individually at their level. So first they earn money, they then pay tax to the IRS, and then eventually after what's left over, if they pay as a dividend, that's given to the stockholders. So effectively, C corporations could be subject to double taxation. But as I said, if you don't know what one is, you probably don't want to be one or don't aren't one. 
one of the biggest changes that does apply to you is a new deduction called the pass-through deduction. And this works for any business that's either an S-Corp, LLC, or just a sole proprietor. If you're an independent contractor, you meet this. And this is like a, a 20%, essentially it eliminates 20% of your net income from your business, not counting in any investments. So let me give you an example. Normally in your business, you pay money, you earn money, and you pay that money directly to the IRS. You don't pay, you don't, it's not like a corporation that pays it to the IRS and then pays dividends. You're paying it, you're, all that income earned by your business flows through to you on your personal tax return, and that's what you pay the IRS. Now, the way this business, and by the way, the way, uh, there's a couple of things you need to know. You need to know a concept called adjusted gross earnings. And what adjusted gross earnings is, you take your total earnings, net earnings from your business, minus your business deductions, and you add other personal income, other personal income being job income, spouse's earnings, you sold some property, interest, dividends. And that concept is known as adjusted gross income. From that, you subtract any personal deductions. And that is things like your standard deduction, itemized deduction, donations, things like that. And that gives you your taxable income. And then you just simply do a certain rate, it's just a mathematical uh, thing you do. And that's how you figure out how much tax you pay. Well, there's a, there's a special pass-through deduction that allows you up to 20% of your net business income, so you have to have a profit, 20%, you can exclude from being taxed. Essentially, you take that 20% of your net business income and you report it as a personal deduction. So let's say you make $50,000 of net business income. You'd multiply that by 20%, which is $10,000. You now increase your personal deductions by $10,000 in computing your taxable income. And this applies to any pass-through entity, okay? And that's one of the big, big changes. This is one reason why people really should be in business today over since being an employee. Now, the, what, the rules for what you ca can do and cannot do have changed. The game has changed. If you don't know the changes, then you might not win. But if you learn the new rules, then you can reap tremendous rewards, like this 20% deduction, for example. Now, before I get into it, I want to give you a little uh, interesting uh, thing that happened to me. Uh, my partner brought me into his office and he, he brought in seven strangers who I never met before and he gave, he issued me a challenge. And by the way, you might see eight of them here because one of them brought their spouses. And he wanted me to find $10,000 for each of them in missed deductions. And to make it harder, I had to do it in 10 minutes or less by looking at their tax return. And even more, even more difficult, he made sure that every one of these people used either a professional preparer or used one of the online software like uh, TurboTax or Microsoft Money. Well, the good news is I went seven for seven. I found at least $10,000 in savings for each of them. And the problem is that if I reviewed their tax return again, I would find even more money because built into it is, the pr is a problem in the current tax system. And the reasons that they overpaid are still in the new system. What's interesting is that, uh, and based on my, my experience, self-employed people are overpaying their taxes to the tune of billions. That's with a B, folks, billions. And I'm not the only one who noticed this. John Potter, who's head of the American Institute of CPA, said the exact same thing. And even more importantly, 95% of all self-employed people don't think they overpay. I bet you don't think you overpay. And why do people overpay? Well, they overpay for three reasons. One, lack of knowledge. They don't know what they don't know, as you'll learn today. The second thing is procrastination. You know, if you don't have something triggering you, kind of like a little birdie whispering in your ear to, do, to write certain things down in a certain way, what's going to happen? You're not going to do it. And then you will lose all kinds of money. So procrastination is just a huge killer of deductions. And the third killer is fear of the IRS. And you don't need to fear them. If you know what you're doing, there's nothing they can do. If you, if you have the right documentation, it's not, not going to hurt you. But people think that they fear the IRS and they'll, they'll take less in deductions that will reduce their chance of audit, which is not true, by the way. That will not reduce their chance of audit. One of the biggest myths in taxes causes more people to lose money than any single mistake I can think of. And it's only seven words long. And those seven words are, my accountant takes care of my taxes. And by the way, I have a similar myth my spouse takes care of my taxes. If you learn anything, learn that. Now, get, don't get me wrong. Accountants are absolutely essential. Everyone 
who's self-employed should have an accountant. But if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have the right documentation, there's only so much they can do for you. It's got to be a partnership effort. Everybody understand that? Now, here's another major problem. And this is sort of, you know, most people treat their accountants like a gym membership. Let me explain what that means. You go, and where I am, I live in Florida. Come New Year's, after New Year's, everybody makes these resolutions to lose weight. And I see all the classes that I'm in, all the exercise classes, start filling up with people with good intentions. But after about a month or two, they start dropping out. And then the regulars can go without having being too crowded. Well, the same thing is true with accountants. The system is essentially geared against you and against them. And here's the reason. A good accountant does somewhere between two and 300 tax returns in an average season. Now, what's interesting is that the first six weeks, there is usually for them to get new clients and for them to get the, and for you to get all your, your documentation. So most of their work is done in just six weeks, the latter half of tax season. Now it's true, they do extensions and things like that, but most of the work is done in about six weeks. Well, if you, if they, even if they work 12 hour days for each day of that six week period, that you find, if you did the numbers, that they, they spend roughly, they have no more than two hours to work on each tax return. Now, is that enough time? No. And that's one of the big problems because they don't have enough time to do the return. And there's going to be a lot of mistakes made by accountants as well as by individuals, especially with this tax law. But as I said, you have to have an accountant because they, you need to do your part by knowing the rules and knowing the right documentation. So what is your part? Number one, you need to understand the difference between a person who files your taxes and one who does tax planning, because there's a difference between filing your taxes and doing tax planning. I do tax planning. I don't do file taxes. They're very different, different people. And you need to understand a little bit about, about taxes and how they work, because knowledge is power. If you don't know about the new tax law, you won't be taking advantage of these things. And by the way, don't expect your accountant to tell you this information. They're busy doing the 2017 tax return. They're not even taking continuing education courses. They're not going to worry about this new law until after April 15th. And then they'll start taking continuing education. And then they'll start disseminating the material. But if you wait for them to give you this information, you're going to be waiting. You're going to be missing out in at least five months of deductions. I'll tell you that. So my mission, as I mentioned, most people are overpaying the taxes. My mission is to make sure that you never overpay again. And I accomplished this in two ways. One, I accomplished this because I like teaching people and I use, I use webinars like this to teach people. But we also accomplished this through our software application called TaxBot, where it becomes very easy to stay compliant. And I'm going to be talking about more about that later. Now, before I get into the business deductions, I want to get into the personal end of it because you need to understand this first and see how to get around it how businesses get around all these personal limitations. The first change that was made from a personal point of view is that the standard deduction was raised. Actually, it was almost doubled. For single individuals, it was raised to $12,000 per person. For married filing a joint return, it is $24,000 per person. And the reason I'm covering this is that in order to itemize, you have to exceed the standard deduction. So by raising the standard deduction, that means fewer people are going to be able to itemize. But if you're in business, there's a way to get around this. So I'm going to mention that as we get into that. The second big change on a personal level is that property, state and local taxes have been capped at $10,000. You used to be able to write off all your state income tax, all your property taxes as an itemized deduction. Now there is a cap of $10,000. So let's take an example of how this, what this means to you. Let's say you pay $8,000 in uh, property taxes and another $6,000 in state income tax for a total of $14,000. Well, under the old law, you could have written this off. Under the new law, you are limited to $10,000. Effectively, you lost $4,000 deduction as a result of this. And I'm going to show you a way to get around this too. The third major change on the new law is that they lowered your ability to deduct interest on your primary residence and secondary residence in total of up to $750,000 of total debt. Now, what's interesting is they didn't limit interest, so to speak. They, you, can, you can pay 18% interest, the government doesn't care. What they did is they limited interest on up to $750,000 of debt. So if you have 800,000 or 900,000 of debt on your home, you can only write off interest on the first 750,000 of it. In addition, you can no longer deduct interest on a home equity line of credit. So if you're paying that, you should pay it off because you cannot deduct that anymore. 
but I'm going to show you how to get around some of the $750,000 limitations as well when I get to the business side. And the final change from a personal standpoint is that the government reduced, you know, in order to claim medical expenses, they have to exceed a certain threshold. That threshold was 10% of your adjusted gross earning, your adjusted gross in income. Remember I told you, told you about that? That's your income minus your personal deductions. Well, they reduced that from 10% to 7.5%. And that sounds good, but I'm going to show you a way how to get around this altogether. You're going to like that a lot. But let me show you how this works. Let's say you make $100,000 of adjusted gross earnings. You have $10,000 of medical expenses. They normally have to exceed 7.5% or $7,500. So you want to get a $2,500 deduction into this rule. But as I said, I'll show you how to get a, get a deduction for the whole 10,000. Give me a moment. Now, here's an, a startling statistic. IRS wins 88% of all audits that they perform. Well, you know, think about this. And the reason is absolutely stupid. The reason, the number one reason they win is that people did not have the right documentation. I see thousands of network marketers. And when I look at their records, they do not have the right documentation. But not you. You guys are going to know exactly what you need. And you, you will be absolutely 100% bulletproof. How will that feel? You know, I want to emphasize something about tax law, kind of a little uh, policy here. You know, in criminal law, you're innocent until proven guilty. <clears throat> in tax law, you're guilty until you're proven innocent. You're actually better off committing a murder. At least the government has the burden of proof. With tax law, you got that burden of proof. And I want to emphasize this. That's why it's so important to have the right documentation. All right. Now let's start off with business deductions. Enough of, uh, of our, per social, our personal service message. Let's get into business deductions. The first big change is on automobile deductions. They've made them insanely profitable. If you follow what I'm going to be telling you today, you guys will save hundreds of thousands of dollars over a lifetime. Seriously, I'm not exaggerating. Now, there are two methods of writing off a car. One is the IRS standard mileage rates, which is a very similar, very simple method. The other is the actual method. Both of them require a mileage log. I and mean, you got to show how many miles were for business under both methods. We're going to start off with the IRS method. Now, what is that? First of all, that's a very shortcut method. It's a very simple approach. IRS gives you 54 and a half cents a mile this year for every mile you drive for business. And by the, the point of the problem with this is that when you use the IRS method, uh, you cannot deduct things like gas, oil, repairs, insurance, depreciation, and so on. And by the way, who determines how many miles we drive for business? Does the IRS or do we? And the answer is we do. And how do we do it? From a tax tracker or tax organizer. Now I'm going to get into that more uh, as I get on. So let's take an example. Let's say that tomorrow, uh, let's, let's, let's say this year, you put on 15,000 miles for business. IRS gives you 54 and a half cents a mile. You get an $8,175 deduction. Clean, neat, and sweet. The problem is that the IRS method, unless you drive a very, very cheap old car, is almost never a good idea. Because what happened was the government dramatically improved the depreciation on cars, but they didn't change the IRS method that much. So it's really a bad deal to take this method now, in almost all cases. So, what is the actual method? This is the other method. Before I get into that, you need to know a certain concept that I want to give you called business usage. Now, what does that mean? When you talk about a business usage, business usage means your business mileage divided by your total mileage, and that's your business usage. Now, what does that mean? That is the percentage of car expenses that you can write off. So let's take an example. Let's say this year you put on 8,000 miles for business. Your total miles is 12,000 miles. 66% of each of your car expenses can be deducted. And that's what I mean by business usage. And I'm going to be getting back to this again. I want you to remember this because we are going to be using this later on. So let's get to the actual method. Now, the actual method is, as I said, is the better approach. This is where you track your expenses for gas, oil, repairs, uh, uh, supplies, car wash, and other things out of pocket. Insurance. You then multiply that by your business usage. Remember that concept again, business usage, uh, mileage by total mileage. And that's the percentage of all these things you can write off. That's the percentage of your gas and oil and, and so on. So let's take an example. Let's say you have $12,000 of actual out-of-pocket expenses. Your business usage is 80%. You can write off $9,600. That simple. 
Now, that's, however, in addition to depreciation. That's just the operating expenses. You also get to write off your car. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a little pop quiz, and this will explain depreciation. Let's assume I owed you a dollar today. Here's my question to you. Would you rather I give you the dollar back right now, or would you take one quarter a year each year for the next four years? Which would you prefer? Hopefully, you took the dollar today. And why would you want the dollar today? Because you can invest it and make more than a dollar over the next four years. That's why you want the money today. Well, unfortunately, depreciation is like getting quarters over the next four or five years. Okay? That's the problem with depreciation. So the key is you want to get your money as soon as possible. Now, to give you an idea, there used to be luxury limits on automobiles. For some reason, Congress had this thing that if you bought a luxury car, they didn't want you to be able to write it off too quickly. And if you look at the numbers, you'll see, let's say I buy a $50,000 BMW, I can only write off 11160 in year one, 5100 in year two, 3000 in year three, 1875 in year four, and so on. However, under the new rules, if you buy a car this year, now many of these numbers, other than the first year, have almost tripled. For example, the maximum second year depreciation used to be 5100 It's now 16000 so that you get three, basically from most of these years, you get three times the depreciation that you would have been allowed last year, for example. Now, to give you an idea of how good this is, let's say you buy a $50,000 BMW and use it 100% for business. I know you're not going to use it 100% for business. I'm just using this to make my math easy and to make my life easy and to explain it. To write off that 50,000 BMW under the old law, it would have taken you 18 years to write that off. Under the new law, you can write the whole thing off in 5.3 years. As I said, the, the new rules are insanely beneficial to you as distributors of, of, of a network marketing company or any other small business. Insanely beneficial. See that? Now, there are some ways to legally skirt the rules where there's no time limits and you write off the whole car, the whole business usage in the first year. Wouldn't you like that? So who are the winners? you got to beat certain winners. The winners are, first of all, qualified trucks. If you have a qualified truck, you get to write off 100% of the business use of that truck in the year you buy it. So let's take an example. Let's say you buy a $50,000 truck. Uh, let's say an F-150 is a good example of that. Use that 90% for business. You write off 90% of 50 or 45,000 this year. Boom. You, you eliminate all the uh, yearly caps. You don't have to worry about the time limits. It's phenomenal. I mean, this is really powerful, folks. So what's a qualified truck? A qualified truck means you meet the following rules. You can see this on the slide. One, it's got to be on a truck chassis. Two, it's got to be new to you. It doesn't have to be a new truck. That's interesting. But just new to you. It could be a used truck. Three, no rear seating. Otherwise, you come under the SUV rules. Four, it has to have at least a six-foot cargo area or more. And five, it has to have a gross vehicle weight, which means carrying weight, of over 6,000 pounds. And how would you know whether your vehicle has a gross vehicle weight of over 6,000 pounds? Very simple. You can Google it, or you can go and open up the driver's door, and in the door jam, it lists gross and net vehicle weight. It's that simple. Okay? You look for GVW, gross vehicle weight. Now, in addition, qualified vans and qualified SUVs are the second winners. Because you can also write off under what they call bonus depreciation, which has been changed, 100% of the business use. So let's take an example. Let's say I buy a Cadillac Escalade, which a lot of accountants are buying. It happens to be a qualified SUV. I use it 90% for business. I can write off 54000 of that Escalade in year one, well above the luxury unit limits. So what's a qualified van or qualified SUV? Well, they're very similar to a truck. First, you've got to have a truck chassis, just like a truck. Secondly got to be new to you. Again, it doesn't have to be new, just new to you. Thirdly, it's got to be able to carry passengers, whereas a truck, you have to have at least a six-foot cargo area. That's not true here. Here, it just has to carry, have rear seating. Number four, it has to have a gross vehicle weight of over 6,000 pounds, so it's the bigger SUVs that qualifies. I don't know if you know this, but the, the larger BMW SUV, I think it's called the X5, has a gross vehicle weight of 6,002 pounds. Now, you think that's coincidental, by the way? I could just see the, the engineer saying, oh, we've got to add some lead bars to the chassis. I can just see that happening. Now, I do want to emphasize both methods require a mileage log. Now, why? Because you need to prove your business mileage. IRS doesn't give you 54 and a half cents times all, times all your miles. It's times your business mileage. 
Same thing. You don't get to write off all your gas and oil and repairs. You got to have the business usage. So you must have a log for any method you use. And the word is must. I want to emphasize, you're going to see increased audits with, you know, this tax law is going to create a bunch of deficits. And IRS is going to try and make up that deficit. And one of the ways they're going to make it up is, is to try and look for things like this to, to um, disallow. Having a good mileage log is very, very important, probably more important now than ever. Okay. Secondly, when you sign your tax return, you sign it. There's a little statement under, under the signature page. It says, under penalties of perjury, <coughs> that your records uh, are solemnly, you solemnly swear your records are, are complete to the best of your knowledge. You must sign that return with that with that oath and if you don't know it you know it now you make that oath every single year now remember this is a very easy target for the irs and i can tell you right now cars are the number one audited area by the government so having a mileage log isn't something that's nice isn't even something that's great it's it's vital absolutely vital for everyone listening to this everyone in your downline must have a mileage log and must use it now let me mention a little bit about an, an alibi. I'm, I like watching detective shows. I'm sure you do too. And one of the things I like about detective shows is that they're very, you know, I, I like, well, I like the fact when, 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 a, when a detective interviews someone, what's the first thing they want to find out? And the answer is, do they have an alibi? Because if they have an alibi, they move on to the next person. Well, tax-wise, it's the same thing. If you have a good alibi, then IRS will leave you alone. So what is an alibi for a good mileage log? Well, let's take a look. You got to have, number one, the date of the trip. So I'm going to write in January 14, 2018, for example. Then you have to have the total mileage for the trip. Or you can have beginning, ending, odometer reading for each trip, but I think you're better off with the total mileage. You can use your odometer reading or the address. Again, the address is something that's very important. 334 Make Believe Circle. Okay. And finally, which is something that a lot of people miss, you have to have a description, a specific description of the business purpose. You know, there are trackers out there. Like there's one I'm thinking of. It's very famous where you slide to the left, it's business. Slide to the right, it's personal. But they don't necessarily force you, unless you slide it in a certain way, to ask you for your business purpose. If those people don't write down the business purpose, they are not compliant. And there's going to be a lot of very um, upset people <laughs> when they find this out. Now, I want you to notice what I wrote in my alibi met with Johnny Appleseed regarding the orchard investment. Notice how specific this alibi was. If let's assume I had two alibis. Alibi number one, I went to the movies last night. Alibi number two, I went to a 10.30 showing at the Rio uh, seeing um, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Now, which alibi you think is the, more, is the better alibi? Obviously, the second one, because it's more specific. The more specific your alibi, the better it is. We make, mention that, okay? So what's good about TaxBot and good about a good tracker is that it really gives you a good alibi. It gives you the date of the trip. It gives you the total mileage. In fact, it even gives you the, the actual route. You actually see the map, which may, very few trackers do. It shows you where you went, and it gives you a description of the business purpose. And later on, we're going to show you how TaxBot will help you do this automatically. You don't have to do this manually. Go write it in. Now, another big change, it came in on entertainment. What happened is last year, you could write off your plays, your movies, your golf, your football games, and things like that. Starting this year, none of that is deductible. All entertainment is now disallowed. I don't know what the NFL is going to do about their season, their box seats, because those aren't going to be deductible either. Now, the entertainment is gone. What's around is meals. It used to be meals and entertainment were the same, but things have really changed. They've, they've, they distinguish between meals and entertainment. Meals generally can be deducted of up to 50%. And what are things that you can deduct? Opportunity meetings. Any meals served at opportunity meetings are, are deductible. Sales presentations, open houses for realtors, all those meals are deductible. Now, there's one issue that we're not sure of the answer of. And that is, what about a meal you have with a client at a restaurant? Believe it or not, that's up in the air. Nobody knows for sure. The opportunity meetings are fine. The sales presentation are fine. But the the meal at a restaurant, we're not sure. We think it is. And the general feeling among tax practitioners is that it is still 50% deductible. And most accountants are recommending it to their clients and they're taking it themselves. And we recommend it too, but you take it and you document it. The reason we're recommending it is number one, it could be deductible. Number two, even the IRS says it's not deductible, if it's confusing, many times there's a grace period. That's what they did with Obamacare, some of the Obamacare penalties. 
And number three, Congress has announced that it was their intent, at least one of the, one of the head of the Joint Committee said it was the intent of Congress to make the meals deductible. So if, if IRS says it's not deductible, Congress can change the law. But if you don't have the right documentation, you won't benefit from that. Uh, so you really want to take, take the documentation no matter what, okay? So make, keep that in mind. But we do think that meals with clients should still be deductible. Now, what kinds of documentation, what kind of an alibi do you need for meals? You got to have the five W's and an H. Who? What's their name? What type of expense was it? Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Where did the expense occur? Was it at home? Was it Outback Steakhouse? Where? When? What was the date? And most importantly, or as importantly, why? What was the reason? Again, this is your alibi. You want to be as specific as possible. And the more specific, the better. And finally, how much? If you write the five W's in an H, you will never have to worry about an IRS audit again. How will that feel? Have that, never, have that peace of mind of never having to worry about an IRS audit again. And where do you write this? You want to put this in a tax tracker or tax organizer. You know, all of you have homeowner's insurance. Do you not? You have car insurance. You don't use those all the time. In fact, I bet you probably never use your homeowner's. But if, if you don't have it and your house burns down, that's a disaster. You get into an accident, you don't have car insurance, that's a disaster. Your tax tracker, tax bot, is your audit insurance against IRS. It's exactly what you need to keep them off your back. Knowledge is the premium for the policy, like TaxBot University, which we have, which is a whole university setting. Together, you'll never have to worry about an IRS audit again. All right, let's talk about a home office, because home office actually has become a little better under new law. Now, I don't have time to get into the home office rules. We'll do a whole seminar on this. But let me just give you an overview of the way it works. Let's assume you have one room that you use for business, and that room has 300 square feet, and your house has 3,000 square feet. The amount you write off is therefore 10% of your home office expenses. Now, when I talk about home office expenses, I'm talking about things like, things like utilities. You know, you weren't able to deduct utilities before, but now you can. Homeowners insurance, alarm service, home repairs, depreciation, uh, so on. Now, there's something else that's interesting. Mortgage interest and real estate taxes. You can deduct 10% of those as a business deduction. Now, remember what I said, that mortgage interest is limited up to 750000 of debt. This is a way of getting around that, because you can deduct this as a business deduction and write off the interest on up to $750,000 in debt. Same thing was true with real estate taxes. You're limited on $10,000 of real estate taxes to be able to deduct. It was capped. But under here, if they're claiming home office, you can write off the business use of the real estate taxes, and you can write off the $10,000 of debt. So this is a way of getting around the rules. Now, we talked about medical expenses, how they're limited to 7.5% of your adjusted gross earnings. There's, that, there's a much better way. And what you want to know about is something called a self-insured medical reimbursement plan. Now, what is a self-insured medical reimbursement plan? This is a plan that reimburses employees for out-of-pocket medical expenses. They include insurance premiums, eyeglasses, co-insurance, pre-existing conditions, um, braces, all those things. And the way you do this is you hire your spouse in your business. Now, by hiring your spouse, they may do things like lick envelopes. It doesn't have to be full-time. Address envelopes. Okay? Do work on your computer. They then elect family coverage, which means they're covering you and members of the family, such as your kids. By doing that, you're able to deduct not only the medical expenses for your spouse, but for you and your kids too. And not as a medical expense, but as a business employee fringe benefit. You get a deduction and they get that money tax free. And even better, you avoid the 7.5% limitation because this is not a, me a medical expense. This is a business expense. Everyone who is listening to this, everyone should have a self-insured medical reimbursement plan. If you don't have this, you're crazy. I use this with, with my family, and I wrote off about $12,000 of braces for my children this way as a business expense. Now, I do want to mention the self-insured plan, you should have a professional administrator to, to serve as a fiduciary. It's not something you do yourself. They'll provide the plan for you. It doesn't cost much. It's about maybe $40 a month. And I can tell you that this generates somewhere between twelve dollars and $20,000 of deductions. My partner easily generated $18,000 over the last four years of this between braces and medical expenses that aren't covered by insurance and all kinds of other things. This is a huge, huge deal. To find, We have some information on good administrators if you want to find out about them and how they work and 
you know, what their costs are, go to hra.taxbot.com. That's hra.taxbot.com. Just write that down and go there. It's something you, you really want to do, okay? Now, I want to mention, I don't have time to do everything in the law. I mean, obviously, we're running out of time as it is here. I want to give you a good grasp. You need to get a good grasp of the tax laws, and you want to do it as soon as possible. As I mentioned, you do not want to wait for your accountant to teach you. It isn't going to happen before April 15th. They're going to have to take continuing education to learn what's going on. You probably won't find out till probably June or July. You don't want to wait six months for this. You want to change your thinking and business policies and practices as close to January 1st as possible. That makes sense? Now, I want to emphasize here, there's going to be mistakes. This tax law is, is very complicated, and there's a lot of confusion to it. There's going to be mistakes by both preparers and business owners. But whenever there's mistakes, that creates opportunities for the IRS to audit. So you really got to have a good tracker. And, and part of this, by the way, is we have something called TaxBot University, which gives all kinds of information on the new tax law. And I strongly recommend you get that. You, you get to you become a subscriber to that. It's really very important to learn about what's going on. With TaxBot University, it's all done uh, in, a, in a couple of hours. It's all simple. It's a lot like this, but we get into a lot more depth. It's something that you really need to know a lot more about. I want to also remind you that the chances of being audited are about, over a 20-year period, one in three. So if you're the one being audited, then that's, that's it for you. So you want to keep really good records. Now, what's interesting, and I want to emphasize a little bit about TaxBot. Uh, TaxBot is a mileage and expense tracking application. A lot of applications out there are just mileage. We're both, and they're all integrated. You can keep track of your expenses in literally three seconds flat. I designed TaxBot for me. You know, one thing I've learned, if it's simple, easy, and fast, I'll do it. If it's not, I won't. And I designed it with basically three buttons, expenses, mileage, and income. It's really simple. And everything is automatic and automated. And for example, uh, the exp the, our mileage tracking is integrated with a GPS system. You don't even have to turn it on. If you want, you can, but it will turn itself on when you start driving. Actually, TaxBot senses when you're driving and records the trip automatically. You don't even turn it on. You then come back later to classify the trips between business and personal and, and, and decide what, you know, what's the reason for it. And you write that in. By doing that, you are absolutely bulletproof. It's very, very simple. And to show you how it works, you get a detailed map showing the actual route. By the way, very few applications do this. You get the full address for the start and ending location. You're not typing this in, by the way. This is something TaxBot gives you automatically. Let's say you do multiple trips. You can easily merge trips and, and enter one purpose. If you do cal it has calendar integration where it automatically fills in the information from your calendar if it can, they can find it. So it also has that. It has a lot of features that other trackers do not have because we try to make it as simple and easy as possible. In addition, TaxBot will securely connect your bank or credit cards and reconcile with the bank or credit cards and look for missing transactions and see if you want to make them part of TaxBot. It'll ask you, do you want to add this to TaxBot? I mean, the technology here is just phenomenal. Now, our expense tracking is just phenomenal. Our smart match receipt program is unbelievable. You know, here's an example. Let's say you get a receipt. You snap a picture of the receipt. TaxBot is integrated with the phone. So it takes, it uses, well, phone with the phone camera. So it takes, it uses that picture. And once it reads the receipt, it matches it to the right credit card charge. It actually looks for the credit card charge. It then fills in the missing data and categorizes and delivers it for your approval. It can even match receipts from your linked email if you've got an email receipt. And let's assume it doesn't give you the right category. You can then say, okay, wrong category tax mark because it asks you for your approval. This is the right category, and it's going to learn. When you change it, if it sees that anything like that again, it will do that automatically. So it actually learns from you. There's a lot of artificial intelligence here. Our average user spends 12 minutes per month using TaxBot. And get this, it saves the average user $10,587 in taxes their first year alone. I mean, that, what is that? That's got to be over $1,000 a, a minute here. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's unbelievable for an hour. I mean, it's, it's really unbelievable how much this saves. My partner generated $19,508. This is actually a picture of his phone on September 20th, as of September 28, 2017. I mean, the, the, the benefits here are just enormous. We've had people generate, I've seen as much as $54,000.
Now, I want to emphasize that there is an amazing discount that was given to you by Evolution Travel. Normally, we charge $10 a month for TaxBot or $100 a year. <laughs> However, they will give it to you for $5 a month or $60 a year. And it's much cheaper. And if you don't believe me, you can go on our TaxBot site. You will see it's double this price. So you get a very special price. You get it almost at half price. To get access to it, you want to go to the Evolution Travel back office and, and, click, and get on TaxBot and you get it for $60 a year. And it's not even $60 a year. What is, it, what is that, about um, $5 a month? Because it's tax deductible. So it's really only about $3 a month, which is probably about 30 cents a day, okay? <laughs> That's pretty good to get $10,500 of deductions. So I would definitely take advantage of this. This is really going to put a lot of money in your pocket. And I would also look at our TaxBot University. You go to TaxBot.com, you'll find we have TaxBot University, which has a lot of information on the new tax law. We walk you through lot, all the information before you have to wait for your account. That's something I think you should absolutely have as well. Anyway, that ends where I want it to be. I'm going to turn this back over to Derek, and hopefully you'll take my advice. And I apologize to anyone who doesn't get this because you're going to pay a lot more than people who do.